Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Let's try that one more time, see if we're awake this morning. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. It is a good day to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. Every day is a good day to be in the presence of the Lord, but it's a good day to be together and gathered on Shabbat. Amen. He is the Lord of the Shabbat. Well, this morning, I just want to invite you to stand. We're going to pray as we get started this morning. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Avina Malkinu, our Father and King, we bless you today. Yes. Hallelujah. Lord, how our hearts are filled with joy to be in your presence this morning. Lord, we're filled with your joy as we are houses of your Ruach HaKodesh. So, Lord, we just recognize your presence here in our midst this morning. And, uh, Lord, we just open up the doors of our hearts to be able to receive from you, but also to come in relationship with you and lift you up and magnify your name together. You are a great king. You are a great savior. You're a great Lord. You are an amazing friend. Lord, we just thank you for your goodness this morning. We thank you for your joy. And so, Lord, we do. We just enter in together with thanksgiving, with praise this morning. B'Shem Yeshua, everyone said. Amen. This morning, if you have a scripture or a word of encouragement and exhortation, you can come see Elder Mark, who's at the front. And uh, let's enter in together into the presence of the Lord. Yes, we're so excited to worship as a community together. Thank you, Lord. sing for you. Thank 
give you highest praise, highest praise. We have come to love you in this place. We have come, we have come to give you highest praise, highest praise. We have come to love you in this place. We have come to give you highest praise, highest praise. We have come to love you in this place for you. Are the what we want to be. that we sing for you, for you, are the one we want to be, yes, you are shining through, all the praises that we Put on the garments of praise for the Spirit. 
you, Lord, that in this place of proclaiming that you have all authority, that you have all kingdom reign, that we get to lift up the Shema and the Via Hefta. Thank you, Father. If we could join together. <coughs> Shema Israel Adonai Eloheinu Adonai
Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Blessed is the name of his glorious kingdom for all eternity. Yeshua is the Messiah. He is Lord of all. Thank you, Father. Ve'ahavta et Adonai Eloheka, meko levavka, ufko nafshika, ufko meodeka. Vahayu havarim ha'ela, Asher Anuki Misafka Hayom A Lelevecha Veshen Lantam Ibeneka Vidartopam Beshitaka Iveteka Uhlepteka Vaderek Ukshapeka Uf Kamaka U Shaltam Leot Al Yedeka Vahayu Le Totofot Bain Eneka Uf Tavtam Amuzot Beteka Uvi Shareka And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. And these words which I command you today shall be on your heart, and they shall teach them to your children, and speak of them when you sit in your house, and when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise up. And you shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and to be as frontlets between your eyes. And you shall write them on the doorposts of your house, and on your gates. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. I don't want any
seek you the more I find you the more I find you the more I love
of relationship with the Lord. It's the Lord and his goodness that draws all men unto himself, all peoples to himself, his goodness. And that, that loving relationship that there's full, complete trust that's there. And from that place, we can face anything that the world gives or tries to give, knowing that we're right there with him. So I want us to think about that, but I have some words that um, are coming that don't sound warm and fuzzy, <laughs> but from that place of relationship with the Lord, right before him, in his presence, side by side, heart to heart, we can have full trust and confidence in him. Steve and Steve. Um, and Harry, would you come, please? And um, let's see. Stephen, I'd like you to go first. All right. <clears throat> so from Hebrews, Hebrews 4, it says, For the word of God is living and active. <laughs> and sharper than any two-edged sword, and piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit, of both joints and marrow, and able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And the Spirit of God was moving on us today, and the Spirit of God is moving. And some of what's happening is I believe the Spirit is speaking to you personally and speaking about things in your life and touching on it and asking you to open up in those areas and asking you to trust him from that relationship, from that love. It says there is no creature hidden from his sight. You know, we fool ourselves. <laughs> it started with Adam and Eve. <laughs> they thought they could hide in the garden. <laughs> That's crazy. We have an omniscient, omnipotent God there's no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are open and laid bare to the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Yeshua, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession even as he's pointing at things, even as he's probing and showing things in your life. He's been through it, and he's aware of it, and he's walking you through, and he wants you to be free. That's why he's showing you things. That's why his spirit is convicting you and moving, because he wants you to be free. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. Therefore, 
Let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. So in the word, it says today. There's two days. Martin Luther said there are two days, only two days. There's today. And there's the great and terrible day of the Lord. We don't want to wait for the great and terrible day of the Lord. Yield to him today. Because he's moving to heal and to bring you freedom today. Amen. See that you do not refuse him who speaks. For if they did not escape who refused him who spoke on earth, much more shall we not escape if we turn away from him who speaks from heaven, whose voice then shook the earth. Now he has promised, saying, Yet once more I shake not only the earth, but also heaven. Also heaven. Now this, yet once more, indicates the removal of those things that are being shaken, as of things that are made, that the things which cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear, for our God is a consuming fire. So in case you haven't noticed, we've been in a shaking for in this country for a couple of years. I don't know if you noticed that. And in the world. Well, it's about to get a lot more intense, and I'm not going to go into any details as to, as to what that is. I, I've seen it, and there's other very credible prophets that I listen to that are, that are all talking about this. We are not to be afraid. We are not to be afraid. And there are some, the Lord showed me, and he didn't show me who, some in our midst, some that watch by live stream, and you're going to be tempted to be very fearful. We need to keep our eyes on the Lord. This fits so perfectly with the word that Steve just shared. I mean, so perfectly. Um, when I was a young believer many decades ago, many, many decades ago, uh, one year after I came to the Lord, the Lord warned me in a dream that I was about to come under severe demonic attack. I don't, there's not, I don't have nowhere near the time to explain the dream and all that. Literally, within a week of having that dream, this onslaught came on me, and what it was was the devils that got kicked out of me because I was a sinner. Before I came to the Lord, I was in deep darkness. They came back, and each one of them brought seven more. It, the attack was so fierce because they couldn't get me back into my old lifestyle, so they would torment me with fear. I had a nervous breakdown. I was in the midst of that fiery furnace. And some of you are in a fiery furnace right now, and some of you are going to feel that way when the shaking comes. But the fire of God burned in me brighter and brighter and brighter and brighter and brighter. And it got to the point where I overcame it. And not only did I overcome, I was a 19-year-old snot-nosed little rookie in the Lord. The Lord took me and dropped me right into the middle of a situation, don't have time to go into that, that was the magnitude of which still blows my mind to this day. And that segues to the last point. God wants to partner with us. This is what, you got to get this. Not only does he not want you to be afraid with the shaking that's coming, he wants your eyes to be so fixed on him that you're actually partnering with him. See, this is what happened. I was a 19-year-old kid. If God could do it with a former drug addict, you know, lunatic that I was before I came to the Lord, who had just got to say, filled with the Holy Spirit, he can do it with any of you. So don't be afraid. Know that our God is a consuming fire, and the, as a fire of God, as you allow the fire of God to consume you, you're not going to be afraid. You're not going to have any fear. You're going to be fearless. 
So let's get our eyes fixed on Yeshua now. So all this week, I've been sensing in my spirit two words, building altars. And throughout the scriptures, we see the patriarchs, when they built altar, altars, they built them as places for sacrifice, for worship, for prayer, and a place of remembrance of the goodness and mercy of Almighty God. Um, and then if we can apply that to our lives in this modern day, before we can build an altar of our own to the Lord for worship, there may be some strongholds, idols, and high places in our lives that need to be torn down. They need to be made low and completely destroyed, all the way down to the dust. Now, for you this morning, it could be something as simple as maybe spending a little bit too much time doing other things, whether it's you know scrolling through social media or something like that, or it could be as something as giant or as gargantuan as a generational stronghold, and that or uh, cycles of thoughts or sin patterns or unresolved trauma that has a stranglehold on our spirit, torn open a wound in our soul and take it up room in our hearts. But then I'm reminded that God is sovereign. He is not Lord at all until he is Lord of all. We have to place our trust in God more than we trust ourselves. Take every thought captive. Put your faith in the creator instead of in the created. Even if we are faithless, he remains faithful because he cannot deny himself. If we confess our sins, he is also faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for the pulling down of strongholds, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Messiah and being ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. In Yeshua's name. The Lord, the Lord is really good, and he's speaking to us. So I just want to encourage us to just take a moment, press in. You know, he's speaking to us. He's taking the time, and it's important. Um... So, Lord, I just thank you. I thank you for this body of Messiah here. Lord, I thank you that we are echad, we are one in Messiah. And, Lord, I thank you that you are faithful and true and that you speak to us, Lord, and you're encouraging us, Lord, with your goodness. Draw close to me. Confess your sins. Walk in light. He says, be holy, for he is holy. So let us do business with the Lord as we finish up with this, uh, this song. But let us be honest with the Lord. He knows. He knows my heart. He knows where I am. He knows each and every one of us. But he loves us. We're, we're in relationship with him. Remember, it's not a place of fear, but a place of trust that he loves us. And he knows what is best for us. And he wants us to be everything that he's created us to be. And we can't be that if we're not trusting him, walking with him, relying on him and his spirit, and being walking as new creations who he created us to be. So press in. Do, do that uh, little house cleaning, whatever you need to do. But press in. Love him with all your heart, soul, strength, and might. And trust him. Thank you, Lord. Work in our hearts, Lord. The Shemeshua. Amen.
Amen, Lord. Amen. Lord, your love is overwhelming. What you've done for us, Lord, is overwhelming. When we truly comprehend and understand and enter in, Lord, it's overwhelming to us. But, Lord, there's great joy in your presence. Lord, we desire your presence. And, Lord, in perfect love, there is no fear. So thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. You are good. And I thank you for that you seal the work that you're doing in our hearts, Lord. In this congregation, the folks that are watching, Lord, that your sealing is upon us, Lord, with what you're doing in the name of Yeshua to your son's glory. Thank you, Lord. And Lord, from this place of closeness, I, I want us to come and give our tithes, our offerings as unto you, as an act of worship, an act of love, an act of trust that we can trust giving this, this tithe unto you because we trust you, that you are our provider. So, Lord, I thank you. And if you're visiting this morning, uh, we're very glad you're here, but we would ask that you not give your tithe here. It belongs in your local congregation. But uh, if you want to give an offering, uh, that you can make checks out to El Shaddai Congregation, and it will be used for the kingdom's purposes. So come, let's worship the Lord together with cheerful hearts as unto the Lord.
thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for your goodness, Lord. Thank you for your provision. Lord, we put our trust in you, our faith in you, and we just bless your name. We thank you, Lord, for these tithes, these offerings, Lord, and as we hold them up to you, Lord, as an offering, Lord, thank you. Thank you for your goodness. Lord, thank you for your provision. Thank you for your protection. Thank you, Lord, that you rebuke the enemy for your name's sake, Lord. Thank you, Lord, and I thank you, Father, that you will pour out your blessing upon us. Lord, from your windows of heaven, pour out your blessings upon us as we have been obedient unto you, Lord, from a free heart, Lord, not coerced, not under compulsion, but we love you, Lord. Thank you, Father. And I thank you, Lord, for wisdom, for the leadership. Lord, that you give us wisdom to hear your voice, where to sow, when to sow, how much. Lord, that it would be in good, fertile soil and produce a great, great harvest, Lord. And we thank you and we rejoice in that, that we get to share in that uh, great harvest, Lord, and what you're doing. Lord, it is a privilege, it is an honor, and we thank you, Lord. B'Shem Yeshua. Amen. This time I'd like the to invite the Torah team to come forward and let the parents and kids know we'll dismiss you right after the processional. Just a few minutes. My boys need to know that. <laughs> yes. May he who blessed our fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, May he bless my mother, Pamela K. Geis, who has come up to honor God and the Torah. May the Holy One bless her and her family and send blessing and prosperity on all the work of her hands. B'Shem Yeshua. If you are able, if you could rise and join with me. And it came to pass, whenever the ark would go forward, Moses would say, Arise, O Lord, and let your enemies be scattered. May those who hate you flee from before you. For from Zion shall go forth the Torah and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Blessed is he who in holiness gave the Torah to his people Israel. Vayehi ben so Aharon, vayomer Moshe, kum Aharonai, ve'afutzu oivecha, ve'anusu misanecha, mipanecha, ki mitzion tetze Torah, ki mitzion Tetze Torah, Udevar Adonai, Mi Yerushalayim, Baruch Shenatan, Torah, Torah, Baruch Shenatan, Torah, Torah, Leamo Yisrael,
if you would stand with me for the blessing, if you're not already. Baruch Adonai Hamvorach, Baruch Adonai Hamvorach Le'elam Vahed, Baruch Adonai Hamvorach Le'elam Vahed, Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu Melech Alam, Ashar Berharbanu Bekol Ha'amin, Vunatan Lanu Et Torato, Baruch Ata Adonai Noten HaTorah. Amen. Bless the Lord who is blessed. Blessed is the Lord who is blessed forever and ever. Blessed is the Lord who is blessed forever and ever. Blessed are you, Lord our God, ruler of the universe, who chose us from all peoples and gave to us your Torah. Blessed are you, O Lord, giver of the Torah. Amen. Shabbat shalom. I absolutely love the coordination of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We don't talk about these things ahead of time, and Steve Winkler's word, I mean, that's what I'm saying. So anyway, <laughs> um, the portion today is Deuteronomy 7.12 through 11.25, and I'm reading from Deuteronomy 7.16 through 19. The whole portion has a lot of verses in it that the nucleus of each one could make another message. So um, the, two, the three themes that really struck me when I was doing this was, um, and there's a lot more, but God's uh, and Israel's relationship and God establishing it through the Ten Commandments and then um, Israel going into idolatry and Moses interceding, and it goes back and forth. But anyway, that he, it's Israel's relationship with God that is a key. The Lord's assignment to Israel, instructing them to take the land. And Israel's, one aspect of Israel's relationship with the people in the land. Um, so I'm reading from, again, chapter 7, verse 16. Ve'akalta et kal ha'amim asher Yehovah Eloheka notain lak. And you shall consume all the people which the Lord your God shall deliver to you. Lo tahos e ka elehem. And your eye shall not pity them. Ve lo ta'avod et Elohehem ki mokash hu lak. For you shall not worship their gods, for that will snare you. Ki tomar bilaveka. If you should say in your heart, Rabim ha goaim ha ela mimeni. These nations are more too great for me. Eka ukal le ho risham. How can I dispossess them? Lo tira. Mahem, do not fear them. I think we've heard that this morning. Zakor tizkor. Now, a lot of places this is translated remember well, but the word is the same. Um, it's just different forms of it. So it's basically saying remember. You remember. Et asher asa Yehovah Elohecha lifaro they call um, Mitzrayim. All that the Lord your God did to Pharaoh and all Egypt. And then he goes on to enumerate that, saying that he is their deliverer. And then we jump to verse 21. Lo ta'arotz mipanehem. Ki Yehovah Eloheka bikirbeka. El ha el gadol venora. 
and you shall not tremble or shake in their faces or at their presence. For the Lord your God is a great and terrible God among you. Amen. And going on to in English, we're going to read um, chapter 9, verses 1 through 4. I'm actually just going to summarize it because you can see it up there. But basically, God is again telling them, go take the land, go dispossess the people. And he doesn't disagree with them that all these nations are mightier than them. He says, they're greater, they're cities, they're fortified up to heaven, they're tall, they're like the Anakim, like the giants. But know that the Lord, your God, is he who goes before you. He's a consuming fire. And before he said for them to consume them, but now he's saying he's the consuming fire. That's where the consuming comes from, is from him. He'll destroy them. So don't think in your heart that, you know, it's because of how great Israel is that he's doing this. It's because of the wickedness of the nation. So this is a little of a aside, but if you read on in 4, 5, and 6, he says that over and over again that... Um, in three different ways, that it's not Israel's righteousness, it's because of the nation's wickedness. And he knows their hearts. He's not into destroying people. He says he hates it when the wicked die. He doesn't delight in that. And it, Ezekiel 33, 11, he would prefer that they turn and live, just like when Jonah preached to Nineveh, you know, he didn't end up destroying Nineveh. And when he saved Rahab, when Jericho was destroyed, that's his preference. But he knows people's hearts, and he knows when it's given over to wickedness. So he does do the destruction. And so we go back to that first point of relationship. Oh, no, I guess she's not getting it on the screen. Can you get it on the screen? Next one. Uh, no, back. <laughs> Uh, now go forward, go forward. Anyway, um, two more. Anyway, so the first point is relationship. God has a relationship with us, and he told the Israelites 42 times, just in this little portion, he reminded them that he is their God. Um, and if you remember Mark's Torah reading last week, you can review that on the relationship of, <laughs> of you know, us with God. I mean, again, God really coordinates this stuff. The second point is um, our assignment. The, Israel had an assignment, and the assignment was to take the land. And the full blossom and everything of wickedness is destruction. But the enemy thinks it's our destruction or Israel's destruction, but it was really their own destruction. That was the, the fruit of the wickedness that was coming forth and none of the evil. And again, the third point, their relationship with the people. They weren't to fear them. Didn't matter how big the giants were, didn't matter how hard the assignment seemed, they were not to fear these people. And Again, but while they weren't to fear the people, they were go to go it against, you know, they were to fear God. And in a couple of weeks, my husband will be doing a drosh on that. Again, God coordinated this, not us. Um, you may say, great history, glad the Israelites had to face giants, glad God overcame, glad I don't have to. Um, and the disciples might have thought that too until Yeshua gave them their assignment. And the assignment is great. I mean, Matthew 10, starting at verse 5 through 39, I'd like to um, read all of that, but I'm not going to. Um, but Jesus calls his disciples, chooses them, he pulls no punches, and he told, tells them exactly what to expect. He says, preach. They're going to take the land. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out demons. They are going to take, you know, they're going to conquer evil, conquer wickedness, conquer the fruit of wickedness by 
by bringing God's kingdom to earth. And it's how you destroy the fruits of the works of the enemy. But true to form, the enemy is going to use some people to oppose this. He says, I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. Now, usually we think of one wolf in a flock of sheep. But he's saying a sheep in the midst of wolves. Ratio I don't like, right? (laughs) Sounds like the giant thing again. Um, Then he says, beware of men. I'm going to... You know, you could get scourged in the synagogues. Does anybody have any of those here? I don't think so. Any whoops. Um, Not happening here at El Shaddai. That's good. But you'd think that's the place to preach the word of God, right? And then he says, when they deliver you up. Not if. You know, he tells the disciples, when they deliver you up. Don't worry. That's a lesser degree than fear. Don't even worry about it, you know? He, he's got something more. Um, next slide. And then it may even be a family matter, which I won't even go there right now. Um, but then he says, a disciple is not above his teacher. So Yeshua, they called Beelzebub. They said he did things from Satan, you know, and the disciples were going to get you know, called out as if they were doing the wrong thing, too. And that's how they opposed Yeshua. But again, he says, therefore, do not fear. Now, when I think of the word therefore, I think of it as a conclusion that something leads up to it that makes sense for the therefore. But he's just talked about death and persecution. And then he says, therefore, do not fear. So something's a little missing in that for me, but they, they do that, you know, and he was saying to the Israelites, giants, don't fear, you know, so much for logic. Um, <clears throat> the next couple of verses we usually think of in just warm and fuzzy and a greater, you know, nice context, but the next couple of verses come in the face of being told this is the way it's at, you know, there's an assignment I'm giving you, disciples, and you're going to face death and death threats. And then, next slide. Um, And then he says, are not two sparrows sold for a penny, yet not one of them falls to the ground without me seeing. Even the hairs of your head are numbered. I've been told we lose about 100 a day. So God's got a lot of detail to pay attention to. And he says, don't be afraid. I'm paying attention to the details. And so back to the three points again. Um, And we'll start with two. He has an assignment for us. Details might look different than it did for the Israelites. Yeshua had an assignment. God gave the disciples an assignment. He's got an assignment for you. And there may be a lot of giants in the land. He says that, you know, over and over again, they were faced with opposition from people. The enemy uses people to oppose us. But point three is we're not supposed to be afraid of the people that come against us doesn't matter what the assignment is or how big or how scary it looks. We're not to be afraid because, number one, our relationship with, is with God. And he's an awesome God and a consuming fire, something else we also heard today. And he's a consuming fire to the wicked. And he cares for us and he knows the details of our lives. you stand for the final blessing. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech ha'olam asher bachar banu tor admet v'natan nyonanu metra batocheinu Baruch atah Adonai noten ha'torah Amen Blessed are you, O Lord our God, ruler of the universe, who gave us the Torah of truth, 
and life everlasting planted in our midst. Blessed are you, O Lord, giver of the Torah. Amen. Amen. Please join with me with Vizot. Vizot HaTorah Asher Samoshe Lifne Bnei Yisrael Al Pi Adonai Be'yad Moshe This is the Torah that Moshe gave to the children of Israel by the mouth of Adonai and the hand of Moshe. And this is the Torah that declares that the Lord is our healer and prophesies the coming of the Messiah. So this is the time of service that we pray for those who are sick amongst us. Um, so I'd just like to invite you to raise your hands that we can agree uh, for healing for you. Lord, we just thank you. We thank you, Yeshua, that you are our healer, that you came and you died and you rose again and that we can partake in your resurrection life. Uh, Holy Spirit, I just ask that you would move, Lord. I thank you that your heart is to bring healing and wholeness and life, Lord, and we ask for it even now, Lord, in processes that we're walking through, Lord, but also in the miraculous instantaneous, that we can praise your name, that we can testify of your goodness, Lord, to our community, but also to those who don't even know you that they would see that you are worthy of praise and worthy of glory. We lift you high. We honor you. B'Shem Yeshua. Please join with me in Eitzchim He. A tree of life it is to those who take hold of it, and happy are those who support it. Its ways are ways of pleasantness, and all its paths are peace. Turn us, O Lord, to you, and let us return. Renew our days as days of old. It's chayim hi, l'machazim kimba, v'tom cheha meushar, t'racheha darche noam, Vechol netivoteha shalom. Ashivenu adonai. Elecha venashuva. Chadesh, chadesh yamenu. We thank you, Yeshua, that you are coming back again to restore all things. B'Shem Yeshua. Amen. Thank you to our team. Lord, we thank you for Andrew. We thank you for the word that you've placed on his heart, Lord. Uh, Lord, we thank you for the message that you've been speaking to us, Lord, as a community. Um, Lord, that you speak with one voice. Lord, we just ask that you would, uh, just all these different pieces that you've been speaking to us, that you'd plant them deeply in the soil of our hearts, Lord. Lord, that they would be nourished and grow well, even as you prepare us for the days ahead. Lord, we thank you that you care for us so well. B'Shem Yeshua. Amen. Thank you, Timothy. <sighs> you know, today, as we were worshiping in the presence of the Lord, I just found myself entering in so deeply into his presence that I forgot I was speaking today, truly. There was about five minutes there where I was worshiping, and I was like, man, Lord, you're already speaking so much. I can't wait to hear what you, we, you have in your word. And then I was like, oh, that's, you asked me to do that today. <laughs> um, 
So today, I do just feel a burden. It really ties so well. You know, sometimes you feel like you don't even have to get up and speak. But uh, I just felt the Lord put on my heart this topic of intimacy and suffering. And um, it just ties so well with everything the Lord has, has already been doing. And um, I just want to start out by saying, if your most intimate time of worship and relationship with Yeshua is here on Shabbat, then I actually think something's out of order. Yes, this is a highlight of our week. Yes, this is the most intimate corporate time that we have as a community. But we should be getting one-on-one, -on -one, face to face time with Yeshua uh, all throughout the week, all throughout our moments, all throughout our days. And so I feel like there's a, a little bit of a challenge today, but also uh, it's really an invitation, yet another invitation from Yeshua to enter in deeper into relationship. Uh, I do just want to say before we dive in, I think all of the, most of the kids went to classes, but I do just want to say there's going to be some sensitive topics today uh, about persecution, uh, grief, uh, and some other heavy topics. So nothing too, too extreme, but I just wanted to let parents know. So this month, on sundown, August 16th, we begin the Jewish month of Elul. And this is the month leading up to the fall feast, the high holy days, which are coming up much sooner than maybe some of us realize. Uh, in this time, the Jewish people engage in what's called cheshbon hanefesh, which is an accounting of the soul. So it's kind of taking stock of your heart before the Lord, before we get to Yom Kippur. Uh, during the season, you might hear some say uh, the term, the king is in the field. How many have heard that before? Good, so there's some who have not. Um, and this comes from a teaching speaking of the relationship between God as king and man. Uh, Rabbi Chaim Richmond summarized it this way. For the average man or woman, the king is inaccessible, away in his palace, distant and removed. He never dreams he will actually get to see the king, let alone speak with him. Then suddenly one day, while this man is bent over in his menial labor in the field, he feels a gentle tap on his shoulder he turns around, and to his shock, it is the great king himself who is standing over him. I love that picture. I love that picture as friends of Yeshua, and really that's the, the heart of what we're talking about today, what Mark was alluding to. Well, not really alluding, you were just saying it. <laughs> Having trust in Yeshua. The king is in the field with us. This is a season of harvest, and he's right there beside us in the field. These are the last working days before the High Holy Days. And this imagery gives us a picture of the Holy One coming into the mundane. There's still time to be working in the fields. This isn't a time where we're ceasing from labor yet. This is actually a time to keep laboring, but he's here in the midst with us. Uh, theologian Thomas Fuller said that the night is darkest before the dawn. You probably heard that quoted in a lot of movies and other books. And I think that that's really true. There's something there that really rings true. Uh, even the, the darkest part of the night is just before the dawn. Um, the, the most intense pain is before childbirth. And so a lot of times, sometimes the suffering that we're going through is right before the glorious breakthrough. So in this season, we need to cling fast to our great shepherd's words. Today, we're looking at suffering through the lens of our absolute need for God and looking for our king in the midst of the mundane. Randy Clark has a great quote on intimacy with God, and I picked up this book after it was recommended at the Tacoon Conference, and it's a wonderful book, Intimacy with God. It's really just a bunch of testimonies about growing in friendship with Yeshua. And he says, intimacy with God should be the goal of all believers. When we live from a place of intimacy as Jesus did, we too can hear what the Father is saying and see what the Father is doing, and we can join with him in the advance of the kingdom. I don't think that we, like, say that enough. Like, I, like, feel so much joy that I'm friends with Yeshua. Like, I... I don't even know how to say that. Without him, I really have nothing. I feel pretty empty this week to bring a word. But with him, we have everything. Like, when we come up to speak, we really are just talking about our best friend. I mean, it's just so amazing. 
that we know Yeshua. Every single week we say the Shema. We're praying for our people to know Messiah, to know him by name, that his name's Yeshua. Well, we know him. We know him, and more than that, we have intimacy with him. We know the details of his heart. He's not holding back from us. So today, I just feel like there's a few truths that the Lord would would have to remind us of today. And so my overview is this, really focusing on Yeshua as the bread of life, nothing but everything, and not a victim. So I'm going to go back to the Torah reading. Thank you, Pam, for that amazing word that ties in so well. And uh, I'm going to read from a different chapter. Sometimes you never know. Uh, So the reading this week is Ikev as a result. So I'm going to go to Deuteronomy chapter 8, verses 1 through 3. Not by bread alone. You are to take care to do the whole mitzvah that I'm commanding you today, so that you may live and multiply and go in and possess the land that Adonai swore to your fathers. You are to remember all the way that Adonai, your God, has led you these 40 years in the wilderness in order to humble you, to test you, to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his mitzvot or not. He afflicted you and let you hunger. Then he fed you manna, which neither you nor your fathers had known, in order to make you understand that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of Adonai. So the foundation behind really everything shared today is that we're not living on just sustenance for our bodies, that we literally are existing because of the very words of Adonai creating us, that we are sustained by his word, that we're saved by his living word, Yeshua, who came in the flesh. So before anything else, we have to have that. We need to be reminded, and we need to remind one another of that regularly because very easily, it's, it's very quick to look at our surroundings and look at the things that we have not instead of looking at the one that we have. We do not live in our own sustenance, but it's the Lord himself and his words of life. It's such an interesting parallel. If you really look throughout the Bible at this parallel between the Lord's words and eating them as food and as sustenance, it's all throughout there. Now, we're not like, you know, picking up the Bible and eating paper and all those things, but I'm just going to share a few more scriptures. The prophet Jeremiah in chapter 15 said, your words were found, so I ate them. Your words were a delight to me and the joy of my heart. For I am called by your name, Adonai, Elohei vote. And then we're going to jump to the Gospels, to Yeshua. And I'm going to jump to John chapter 6. And I don't have all of these. I'm going to start a little bit earlier uh, than what's on the overhead. So if you have your Bible want to turn there, it's John chapter 6, starting in verse 26. And this is just after Yeshua uh, has been preaching to the multitude. And there's the five loaves and two fish that have been multiplied. Everyone's eaten. The disciples go on. Yeshua goes on. Uh, And then it says that there's a large crowd that realizes he's not there, takes up the boats and follows him to Capernaum. Now, my silly brain, I like to think about about this. Were they even their boats? Like, we already know that they traveled from a long distance. That's why he needed to feed them. And then they're just, I'm like, did they just steal some boats to follow to Capernaum? Anyways, it's just a funny thought. So they follow and they're looking for sustenance. Verse 26, Yeshua responded to them, Amen, amen, I tell you, you seek me not because you saw signs, but because you ate all the bread and were filled. Don't work for food that spoils, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you. For on him God the Father has put the seal of approval. Then they said to him, What shall we do to perform the works of God? Yeshua answered them, This is the work of God to trust in the one he sent. So they said to him, then what sign do you perform so that we may see and believe you? What work will you do? Our fathers ate manna in the wilderness, as it is written, out of heaven he gave them bread to eat. Yeshua answered them, amen, amen, I tell you, it isn't Moses who has given you bread from heaven, but my father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is the one coming down from heaven and giving life to the world. 
So they said to him, Sir, give us this bread from now on, picking up in 35. Yeshua said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. But I told you that you have seen me, yet you do not believe. Everyone the Father gives me will come to me, and anyone coming to me I will never reject. For I come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of the one who sent me. Now this is the will of the one who sent me, that I lose not one of all he's given me, but raise each one on the last day, for this is the will of my Father, that everyone who sees the Son and trusts him may have eternal life, and I will raise him up on that day. Hallelujah. I love in this chapter, you see the people coming, and Yeshua is basically saying, you didn't come for a relationship with me. You didn't come because I'm here. You came because I gave you bread to eat. You're here to satiate a need physically. And they said, what should we perform? What should we do then? And he says, trust me. He brings it back to relationship. Then they start questioning him. Then what sign will you perform? If I'm going to trust you, you need to prove yourself. And he says, I am the bread of life. Over and over, Yeshua is reminding us that he is our sustenance. Yeshua is the word made flesh. We have to keep our eyes fixed on him. It's always been about relationship. In suffering in the wilderness, the Lord showed his people that their sustenance is only through him and by him. It's about trusting Adonai and the one he sent. So often, we make it about what we can simply observe with our physical eyes or a physical need, the mundane. For us to have intimacy with God in the midst of suffering requires us to trust in the one sent for the provision needed. It's to look at Yeshua himself in, in the eye. And I just even want to challenge us today. Uh, we need to test every word that we say to one another against the word of God. But I really felt like a conviction of the Lord for how many times, even today, the things that I say may challenge somebody, something in their personal theology. And so we throw out everything that the Lord is trying to say. But I just feel like just a challenge that the Lord really wants us to take this word and test it. Take these scriptures, ask them what they mean this week. I just feel like the Lord wants to shepherd this in a greater way. It's so interesting, immediately after these verses, this is where the people start questioning Yeshua and saying, wait, don't we know this guy? Isn't he a carpenter? Isn't his dad Joseph? What do you mean? He's the sent one. And they begin to rationalize away what he was just trying to share with him about being the bread of life. So I think that ties in here where we need to test the word, but it's so easy for us to rationalize away the voice of the Lord in our lives. And I just want to encourage us not to do that. Whenever we're in the midst of suffering, we can start questioning the Lord and saying, why did you answer their prayer but not mine? We have to stop the comparison game of our suffering. To experience intimacy with the Lord, the key component is trusting the shepherd. And when we have nothing else but him, we still have everything that we need. So I want to share a story about uh, Reverend Richard Wormbrand. It's the second part, nothing but everything. And Richard Wormbrand is the founder of Voice of the Martyrs, which is bringing attention to persecution around the globe to this day. He and his wife, Sabina, were both Romanian Jews, and they both came to know Yeshua after meeting an uneducated German carpenter who gave them a Bible and encouraged them to read the Gospels. He became a Lutheran pastor, uh, and they were there during the Holocaust. In fact, they lost many of their relatives and friends in the Holocaust. Uh, Wormbrand was arrested in communist Romania in 1948, released in 1956, and then imprisoned again between 1959 and 1964, a total of 14 years in communist prison. He spent nearly three years in solitary confinement in an underground cell 30 feet below the ground. He was repeatedly tortured and brainwashed by having to sit on a metal pole for 17 hours a day 
from 5 a.m. to 10 p.m. at night and listened to repeated recordings saying, communism is good, Christianity is dead. Communism is good, Christianity is dead. Give up, give up, give up. Nobody loves you anymore. Nobody loves you anymore. Nobody loves you anymore. Can you imagine? 17 hours a day. Hmm. You were never referred to by your name and only given a number. If you ever said your name aloud, you were beaten. His wife, Sabina, was also imprisoned and subjected to three years of slave labor. He had health conditions related to his torture for the rest of his life. He could never wear shoes again as his feet had been hit by hammers so many times, trying to force them to announce the name of Jesus. This is one of his quotes from Tortured for Christ. It was strictly forbidden to preach to other prisoners. It was understood that whoever was caught doing this received a severe beating. A number of us decided to pay the price for the privilege of preaching, so we accepted their terms. This was the deal. We preached, and they beat us. We were happy preaching, they were happy beating us, so everyone was happy. <laughs> Can you imagine this? You know, I think there's something for us even in Western culture where we're not experiencing this kind of suffering on a regular basis. But again, it's not about the comparison of suffering. This is really about the Lord, even in the most demonic of situations, showing himself faithful. In the sermon, The Beauty of Nothing, Wormbrand shares the testimony of the difficulty of his nothingness in prison. No Bible, no friends, no family, no community, no communion, no sound, no sunlight, no smiling faces, no children. His cell was soundproof and could hear nothing. Where could there be beauty in nothing? One night he said to the Lord, and uh, I encourage you, uh, I think it's called The Beauty of Nothing is his message. You can find it on YouTube. And he said he was in a cell one night, and he was very close to the end of just giving up. And he said, Lord, I don't know how much more of this I can take. He said, Lord, I have no brothers or sisters. I don't have your written word. I don't have Holy Communion. I have none of these things. But you've spoken directly to people, even to Paul, when he was a persecutor and killing believers. And you came and spoke with him. And as I have nobody to speak to me, would you speak to me tonight? And then in exceptional circumstances, exceptional things happen. And when I asked, Lord, would you speak to me tonight? I heard his audible voice because his sheep hear his voice. What the Lord said to me was, what is your name? And for the first time in years, he spoke out his name, that it was Richard. And he said, Lord, look at my nothingness. I don't even have the elements to take communion. And the re Lord replied, nothing is what I use to create the heavens and the earth and everything in them. You can have communion with me with that most precious commodity of nothing. So the Lord met Reverend Wormbrand in the midst of this horrendous, demonic situation. The first thing he did was remind him of his identity. I see you. I know your name. A really important point. When he's sharing this message, this is years later, in Romania, he's free. He's able to go and preach the word. But he's sharing it saying that the Lord met his need in that place. Now, he wasn't released from prison for some time. He was still there in that soundproof cell. His physical needs weren't met yet, but Yeshua met him spiritually and relationally in intimacy. It's really hard being present with pain. It's really hard being present in suffering. If you're like me, I'm a futurist. So when I'm going through something, it's really hard for me to see into the future that, oh, everything's going to be OK. If you're someone who's like super present in the moment, I think it's, it's almost even harder because all you can see is the pain and the suffering. Whether that pain is loss of a family member or ongoing physical battle or financial or in your workplace or abuse or betrayal, the reality is that each of us suffer. I've never met one person who hasn't gone through suffering. 
The battle is still entrusting the one sent by the Father in the midst of the suffering. The questions begin to arise. You could have healed them, but you didn't. Why didn't you answer my prayer when you could have? And very quickly, we open the door to bitterness, resentment, and judgment towards the Lord. And it can try to take root in our heart. We begin putting God on probation of our full trust in the midst of our pain. But it's really important that we stop the comparison of our pain to one another. I don't know about you, but I can't think of a single time in my life when I've brought pain or suffering to the Lord, and he starts telling me about one of your sufferings. Typically, he reminds me of my relationship with him, or sometimes I've had just a picture of him on the cross and his suffering that he understands, that he knows. But it's really important to, in relationship with the Lord, allow him to speak to our areas of pain. Sometimes it's because we're angry with God. Sometimes we blame ourselves or others. Sometimes it's because we know that the Lord's healing actually brings more pain. Um, so I want to share with you something very vulnerable because I like boasting in weakness so that his grace and power can be perfected in my life. And uh, we overcome by the blood of the lamb and word of our testimony. So this is a journal entry from 2020 when I was going through one of the most painful times in my life, just internally, maybe looked fine on the outside, but uh, the Lord was doing a lot. And this is what I wrote. And I just want to share it with you because it's something I felt the Lord revealed to my heart. It's called Sometimes Healing Hurts. It hurts to let go of control because it means I don't get to guide the hands of the surgeon. It means I must exercise trust even in areas where I feel betrayed. As the surgeon moves with expert precision, the pain actually increases as the diseased areas are cut away. When I trust Yeshua to work on the, the deep recesses of my heart, his light penetrates areas I couldn't see were dying. Perhaps it's my rejection to the premise of pain that tries to hold me back from the promise of restoration. If we keep our eyes fixed firmly on our Messiah, fear cannot exist in the same place because his perfect love casts out all fear. Sometimes healing hurts because sanctification is a process. But the beauty of it all is that Yeshua is in and he's in all the way, and he's in all the way for the long haul. He continues to work daily, moment by moment, in the art of restoration, with each surgery bringing deeper levels of healing and each procedure bringing new depths of trust. Sometimes the healing hurts momentarily, but his healing is complete and eternal. And I just feel like for some of us today, we need to allow the Lord to heal some areas of pain in our heart that are keeping us from intimacy with Yeshua. I think there's some areas where we've put the Lord on probation. And I believe that our relationship with Yeshua, whatever is in that place of intimacy, pours out into all of our other relationships too. So if I'm putting the one who's fully trustworthy on probation, or I'm saying, I'm going to put you on test, Lord, because I'm not sure if you're going to hurt me again. How am I handling all of my other relationships with other people, and we're all flawed? So I feel like there's yet again the Lord inviting us into a deeper healing today in his presence. Yeshua meets us in our suffering. We know he never leaves us or forsakes us. So the last thing I want to talk about is not being a, a victim. And uh, I'm not talking about things not happening to us. I'm talking about not taking on a victim mindset as identity. So here I have just a little definition that suffering is going through pain, distress, or hardship. Victim mentality is feeling that bad things will continue happening no matter what. It's really like losing hope. It's like not being able to see a light at the end of the tunnel. And then we, we can start taking on as our identity. I deserve this or Nothing good will ever happen in my life. Suffering does not denote that you have a victim mentality. Yeshua, obedient to the Father, came willingly to suffer on our behalf. He said this was why he came. He was not a victim. 
I was thinking about this. You know, Yeshua coming and choosing to suffer on our behalf so that our suffering could be temporary. That's amazing. That's amazing. John 10, verse 18, Yeshua said, No one takes it, his life, from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. This command I received from my Father. Romans 8 says that in all things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. I just want to take a moment. We just, Yeshua, we just say thank you for choosing suffering so that our suffering could be temporary. Thank you, Yeshua. Lord, I thank you for the gift of gratitude that tears down our defenses. So just even now in your presence, Lord, even in the middle of this message, we just... We just ask, Lord, that you would pull down those defenses of our heart. We want to know you more, Yeshua. More than we can comprehend, more than we can understand. You've given us a chance to know you. Thank you, Lord. I just want to invite uh, Gabriel up at this time. And uh, I've asked him to share a testimony that he shared with me about the Lord meeting him in a very profound way. And I just pray that as, as he shares this testimony, that would encourage us uh, and just, yeah, encourage the body. Thank you, brother. Thank you for the opportunity. Uh, I'm very humbled um, to even be able to speak on this subject because I know um, many of you have walked through suffering greater, but I, my encouragement isn't necessarily about my suffering as much as a, a time, and this was, I just, the Lord just showed me this morning, it was in 2013, it was 10 years ago, I was going to the last youth summer camp with my kids, in fact, it was the year that my son gave his heart to the Lord, my son's now a pastor, and it was on that, I was dro- going to work, and I had a vision. I don't know how that happens, how you can be driving and have a vision and God's speaking to you. I still haven't figured this one out. But, and I was leaving from work that afternoon early to go to camp. And I'd been in a dry place and I'd been struggling in my faith, in my intimacy with the Lord. And I was just crying out to him, um, I need to know your heart. I, I need to understand. I don't want to go to this camp and just go through the motions. I don't want to just live my life going to work, going through motions. I need an encounter with you. I need to know your heart. And it was then and there that I found myself at the foot of the cross. And what was very interesting, and this was the most vivid, just one of the most vivid things, more vivid than a dream. I started at his feet, at at his feet, and then all of a sudden he raised me up. And you can imagine, this was in the spirit, I'm, I'm raised up. And I, as I'm being raised up, I see his body, I see him there on the cross. It was gruesome, it was vivid, I could see the blood on his body, I could see the, 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 the marks on his side, I could, and as I got closer to his face, I began to see his face, and he was breathing very heavy. And I'm very emotional because this is a gift. This was a gift from my life and my ministry. I saw his face, and he was heaving and grieving, and I saw his eyes, and I saw the crown of thorns, and I saw the blood coming through down his face, and he looked at me. It was hard for him to to talk or breathe, but he spoke to me. He looked at me, and he just went, this is what he said, it hurts, Gabe. It hurts. That's all he said. And everything changed for me in that moment. I wanted to share a scripture, if that's okay. Because he understands. You see, it was that, it took that place. It took the cross. It took his life. This is the God who created heavens and earth, who made himself nothing and took on the nature of a servant and found in human likeness. He poured out himself unto death, even death on a cross. And I was thinking about the scripture. It says, now if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, Messiah. 
if we indeed share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. As we had the prophetic word this morning, I kept hearing a phrase over the last week, and this ties together. There's a place that God is calling us to identity with him. There's no, you can't go around it. You can't go over it. You can't go under it. You have to go through. You have to pass through. The very name Hebrew means those that pass through those that cross over. And the DNA of the men and women of faith are those that pass through, and we have to pass through with him at those places of suffering, at that place of dying to self. And this is what he says, because it's like punishment it feels to us sometimes in the flesh. But it's actually glory, because his fire is refining and it's transforming. We heard that in the prophetic word. This is from Exodus 14, and then I'll give the mic back to Andrew. He says, and it was, was, this is Israel speaking out. This is Israel speaking out to Moses. Was it because there wasn't enough graves in Egypt that you brought us out here to die in the desert? Why have you done this to us? Why have you brought us to this place of fear and suffering, if you will? Bringing us out of Egypt. Didn't we tell you in Egypt, leave us alone? We'll just go on being slaves for the Egyptians. It would be better for us to be Egypt's slaves than to die in this desert. Moshe answered the people, stop being so fearful. Remain steady and you will see how Adonai is going to save you. On that cross, I saw it hurts. It cost him everything so that we could experience everything. Remain steady, and you will see how Adonai is going to save you. He will do it today. Today, you have seen the Egyptians, but you will never see them again. Adonai will fight for you. Just calm yourselves down. Adonai will fight for you. The Hebrew word fight means to prevail, to overcome and to consume, our God is a consuming fire. He's here to consume. Don't fall, fear and fall away. Don't shrink back. Press in and let his hand take you through. Look at the face of the one who is showing forth the suffering of God. He is the point of suffering. There's a mystery in the wisdom of God that we should die to self, that we should pass through into resurrection life with him across the Red Sea by the miraculous hand of God. This is the purpose. This is the only way. What is he doing in our lives to help us understand that our sufferings are producing something? Do we believe this? A glory that far outweighs. It's unthinkable. It's unimaginable, this glory. That's for us. We can't compare our suffering now with the glory that's to be revealed. We have to have an eternal vision. That's why I believe he wants an encounter with us. That's what he gave me that day on the way to camp. I needed to know that he was going to rise again and that I was going to rise with him. Thank you, brother. Amen. I think, Gabe, you summarized it so well. This is the God of creation, again, who created us by his word, is sustaining us with his word. And, you know, Yeshua did not suffer just to suffer. He suffered unto glory. And what that suffering is producing in us, we just haven't seen all of the fruit yet. Today, she was here with us right now. Today, the Lord's words are words of life. Today, Yeshua is the word made flesh. Yeshua is the bread of life. Yeshua brings hope in the darkness. During the season of Elul, it's traditional to read Psalm 27 
each day. And I just want to read the last verses of this chapter because I feel like it just, it pulls everything together. This is one of my favorite scriptures in all of the Bible. I'm actually going to start a little earlier. I'm doing a Roe Todd today. <laughs> Hear my voice when I call the Lord. Be merciful to me and answer me. My heart says of you, seek his face. Your face, Lord, I will seek. Do not hide your face from me. Do not turn your servant away in anger. You have been my helper. Do not reject me or forsake me, God, my Savior. Though my father and mother forsake me, the Lord will receive me. Teach me your way, O Lord. Lead me in a straight path because of my oppressors. Do not turn me over to the desires of my foes. For false witnesses rise up against me, spouting malicious accusations. And we can read this out loud together, these last two verses. 13, I remain confident of this. I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and take heart and wait for the Lord. Let's read that again. I remain confident of this. I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and take heart and wait for the Lord. I love this quote by Richard Wormbrand. He says, there was once a fiddler who played so beautifully that everybody danced. A deaf man who could not hear the music considered them all insane. Those who are with Jesus in suffering hear this music to which, no, which other men are deaf. They dance and do not care if they are considered insane. That's friendship with Yeshua. I don't, I don't care if, if the world thinks that I'm insane for loving Yeshua, you know, because it's real. And he meets us in our suffering. He meets us in the real places. And I just want to even encourage us here, you know, sometimes we, we put on our happy Shabbat face. And we come to service and we try to look like everything's together in our lives. But the Lord is with us in the darkest nights. He's with us in the hospital rooms. He's with you right now watching online. I think that there's some that are not able to come in person because you're in a season of physical suffering. He's there with you right now. And he is the hope of glory. He is Yeshua, the King of glory. So I just feel like there's an invitation today. As I said, we're about to enter into the season of Elul. This is a season of preparation. And the shepherd is calling us, and he's giving us an invitation into deeper relationship with him. So I just want to pray for us. If that's you, I just encourage you to stand right now. And uh, after the service, we'll have a few people available up front. If you feel like you're in a season where you feel a lot of pain, uh, or even that you've put, had to put the Lord on probation because you don't know if you can trust him. He wants to minister to that today. And uh, we'd love to be able to walk with you in this season with the Lord. You know, we were never created to suffer alone. When one part of the body hurts, we all hurt. So I just, let's just pray right now in the presence of the Lord. Lord, we just thank you. Oh, we thank you, Yeshua, for what you've done. We thank you for coming as the word made flesh. Lord, I just pray for all those who are watching online, all those who are standing right now who just feel like they've been in a season of pain, of just questioning, Lord, can I trust you? I'm waiting for the breakthrough. So I just pray that you would, we know that you want to meet them right now. Lord, I just pray that even in this coming week, there would be moments of intimate fellowship with you. We thank you, Shua, that you are faithful. We thank you that you are Emmanuel, God with us. Thank you, Lord. I just want to pray for those of us who've been walking with the Lord and we're trusting the Lord, but we're, we're hungry to go deeper in intimacy with Yeshua in this season. I just invite you to stand. We just want to join in faith. Thinking of the old hymn, "'Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus, just to take him at his word." Lord, I, we just want to break off even just a overcorrecting spirit, a religious spirit from our hearts. We want friendship with you, Yeshua. 
I just pray for all of us right now, Lord. We just, we want more of you, more of your love, casting out any areas of fear, breaking down any boundaries. Lord, we allow gratitude to grow in our hearts and in our minds to be able to break down defenses. We shut down the lie that Yeshua, you are not faithful. We shut down the lie that you are not the way, the truth, and the life in any shadow, in any corner of our minds or our hearts. Yeshua, we thank you that we can have intimate friendship with you. We thank you that where can we go from your presence? Where can we flee? We just thank you for your goodness. We thank you that you are a good shepherd. We thank you that with you we can suffer well. We thank you that we can meet you, Yeshua, in our suffering. We thank you that you are our sustenance. So, Lord, I just pray for us as a community that in this coming week, that we would grow in intimacy in our relationship with you. Just thank you in the prayer time before the service, just that each of us would take a step deeper in this season. We thank you, Yeshua, that you are the king. We thank you that you are in the field with us. And Lord, we thank you that we will see a harvest in the name of Yeshua. So Lord, I just pray that you would seal us with your peace today. Seal us with your shalom and your hope. B'Shem Yeshua. Amen. you can all stand. I can join together as family knowing that the Lord is here with us and we are here with one another in community, that we're a family. You know, the Lord walks with us. I was just thinking about even uh, Hananiah, Michelle, and Azariah, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abendo, Abednego of, uh, you know, the Lord met them in the fire. Now, he also saved them, but they did go in the fire. Um, but they were also together. And we have this relationship with the Lord, but we also get to walk through suffering, walk through trials with one another. So please join with me. Yiva <clears> Adonai <throat> Veishmarecha Yair Adonai Panavelecha Vikunecha Yisa Adonai Panavelecha Veyasem Lecha Shalom. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord shine his face upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his countenance towards you and give you his peace. B'Shem Yeshua. Shabbat Shalom. Let's be keeping our youth and Elevate team in prayer next week. Monday they leave for camp. Monday through Friday. So I just want to encourage us to be interceding for them as they encounter the Lord together in his presence. Amen. Shabbat shalom.